if you want to, you could uh, just kind of take notes, follow along, watch, right? Um, if you want to actually break your stuff out and kind of follow along as I'm doing it, um, just to get a feel for it, that's, that's fine as well. You're not going to want to actually glue and put everything together until you watch me do the demo and then you know you can have a shot at it on your own um so let me just switch over to the other phone and we'll get started just try to switch over And again, guys, if you guys cut out or something, please just hang tight and rejoin the meeting. hear me can you see me yep excellent how good am i all right so i'm going to set up the work table right about there i think that should give you guys a good view of everything i'm doing um, if you guys can't see um, or need an explanation of anything please just let me know all right Let's get the chords out of the way. Um, so, um, so anytime you're going to do any kind of a work project, you know, the very first thing uh, that's really important to do is to set up your workspace. All right. Get it clean, prepped, put everything in its place. All right. And, um, you know, write this down in your sketchbooks. It's a very important phrase. It's called mise en place. It's French. It's spelled M-I-S-E. It's the first word. The second word is E-N. And the third word is place. P-L-A-C-E. Mise en place is a phrase that actually comes out of um, kitchens in, in France. Right? It's, um, it's a chef's eating or a chef's kind of, I don't know, law, you might say. Um, when you walk into the kitchen, right, to make your meal, dinner, pro, whatever you're going to be doing, right, uh, it's not like you can just walk in and just start throwing spaghetti at the wall, right? Um, you have to preheat the oven. You have to make sure you have clean uh, plates and clean silverware, right? Um, you have to make sure you've gone to the store and bought all the right stuff. Right? Um, certain things need to be thought out. Uh, uh, you know, there's all these things. So mise en place means put everything in its place. And if you do that, your whole system goes a lot easier. And I'm sure all of you can appreciate that. We all have been sloppy about our approaches to doing things before. And it's like Tasmanian devil, right? We just kind of throw ourselves into something and before you know it you know your whole desk and workspace is just one pile of junk and you can't figure out where you put your pencil down um, so that's very common and learning about how to be disciplined in your work studio whether that's building sculpture or whether you're a graphic designer 
um, still the same thing. Whether you're sitting down to make a sculpture or whether you're sitting down at your computer to start a graphic design project, these on place, right? You don't just start popping open Adobe Illustrator and messing around with a dozen files without knowing what folder you're going to be able to put them in or organize anything or, you know, put your uh, original templates in the right spot. It doesn't matter what it is. Mise en place is a very good thing to learn and do. Um, so, um, first of all, you need a clean work area. When you guys uh, make your boxes, it's going to be really, really important that the surface you're working on is flat and clean. All right. That means you got to check that surface. Make sure there's no like little bits of crap on it. Now, in a sculpture studio, that could be little pieces of wood, it could just be dirt, it could be little particles of metal, whatever. Um, in your home, who knows, you know, but you need to have a very nice, flat, clean level surface. Uh, and you can check that very easily. You know, all you have to do really is just, you know, lay long strips of your boards down on the surface. And as long as they sit flat, you know, you've got a good workspace. So I've already gone ahead and cleaned up my workspace. Um, I've got my wood, all right, ready to go. I've got my roll of masking tape, which all of you guys um, bought at the beginning of the semester. Um, I've got some paper towels, all right? These are gonna be for my cleanup. And I've got a tiny little bit of water in this bucket right here. I've got my wood glue that all of you guys uh, received and picked up. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do Put on my safety glasses. That's the most important thing every single time. No matter what you're doing, put your safety glasses on. All right. Your eyes are the one thing that are the most vulnerable to being injured when you're doing projects. And um, as someone who had to once go to a doctor and have my eye scraped with a tiny hypodermic needle so they could get the rust stain out of my eyeball. Trust me, wear your glasses, all right? You don't want this to happen to you ever, all right? Um, fundamental one thing, put your glasses on every time. Um, all right, so um, wood parts. Oh, and of course you guys have a, a sheet of plexiglass and then you have one sheet, of, um, this is called masonite, M-A-S-O-N-I-T-E. The wood board you guys are using is pine wood. All right. Pine wood is the most common material, uh, a wood material that's used in the United States and pretty much anywhere in the Western world. Um, other countries, you know, who might have um, greater quantities of, say, bamboo or whatnot, that might be the more common material there. For us, it's pine. Um, the reason why pine wood is so popular and um, easy and economical, um, pine trees grow really fast, basically. Um, and now, mostly in the Northwest and Canada, um, there are just miles and miles and mountains and mountains of pine trees. And essentially, they can cut down the pine trees as fast as they, the, I should say that the other way. The pine trees grow um, almost as fast as they can cut them down. So in terms of sustainability and ecology, using pine, you know, is the, one of the best you know, choices that we can make in terms of using wood. Um, there's different... Uh, there's different levels of pine, or I should say qualities of pine. Um, you know, there's some pine trees that are very young and very crappy and they cut them down and they sell that wood. Um, and that's, you know, considered raw pine. And then there's what's called select pine. And that's what you guys have. You guys have select pine. So the wood you guys are looking at, when you, know, when you look at it, you'll notice that, you know, it's, it's got a nice, a uh, very firm grain to it. There's not a lot of weird little scars or any kind of strange knots or whatnot. Um, whereas crappy wood or less select pine, let me pull these out for you here. Okay. 
so we can see in this piece of wood right here, you'll notice all of these, these you know, parts of dark areas. These are big, gigantic knots that are in the pine. And while these are often aesthetically very pleasing when you're building certain things, um, they actually are, um, you know, sort of like warts in the wood and weak spots, right? Um, so, um, what you guys are going to see in the wood that you have is just there's a certain flatness and cleanness to it that you might not get in um, a lesser quality type of pine wood. Uh, you know, um, understanding where wood com comes from is really kind of important. Um, once you get into you know doing more woodworking in the future, you're going to want to know more particulates and details. Uh, first and foremost, the wood that you guys are using. When you go to the store, right, they have stock material, just stacks of wood, and you walk up and you say, you know, what do I want to buy today? And for this project, we ordered a one by six. All right. When you go into the store, um, on the label, it says one inch by six inches on these boards that you guys have. All right. Now, <laughs> let's talk about that. Um, that one by six, if you actually put a tape measure on it, all right, you're going to actually find it's not six inches. Um, it's actually five or five and a half inches. When you put the other side on the one inch marker, you're going to find that's not actually one inch. That's three quarters of an inch. All right. Why? Why do I go into the store and they tell me that I'm going to buy one inches by six inches and it's not actually that? Here's the reason. Um, what they do is that out in the forest, they chop the tree down, all right? And they take that tree, they throw it right on the back of a truck, and it goes to a sawmill. And these gigantic saws just chop it right up, right? And that first chop that they do is about one inches by one inch by six inch. Then they take those one inch by six inch pieces of wood and they put them in this big gigantic oven, which they call a kiln, um, same, same name as you would find in a ceramics shop, right? And inside of that kiln, they dry the wood. You can't use just green wood. Wood has to be dried out or else there's moisture in it and that will cause black mold, rotting, all sorts of things. So the wood you buy in the store has been dried in a big gigantic kiln. Um, when it dries in the kiln, it shrinks a little bit, right? A little shrinkage. Makes sense, right? So after it shrinks a little bit, they pull it out of the kiln and they cut it to make everything even and flat and squared off. When they do that, they lose a little material. And now the wood is three quarters of an inch by five or five and a half. Now that is called that that feature, that thing they do. The reason you know the, that when a, a piece of material is not the size they say it is is called the nominal. You should write that down. N O M I N A L. Nominal. And it's not just in wood. All right. Many, many materials that you buy, whether it's pieces of metal or sheets of glass, um, all of these things these days have a nominal to them. And so even like when you buy a panel of glass that says it's a quarter of an inch thick, the glass companies now make those quarter inch thick panels slightly, slightly smaller. Um, their argument is that the processes they use to make glass uh, have made them stronger than they used to be. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're a glass manufacturing company and you can shave this tiny much off of the material that you're actually making, that might be a million square yards in a year. That's a massive amount of money that you're making just by selling people something that's just a little smaller than what you actually say it is. Um, so the nominal is something very common. It happens in wood, happens in a lot of different materials. And you need to be aware of that because when you go to put something together and you think it's going to come out to a certain size and all of a sudden you're surprised, you need to
need to understand that they didn't actually sell you something that's one inch thick, they sold you something that's three quarters of an inch thick. Yeah. All right, well, lucky for you guys, um, you know, this is all pre cut for you guys and worked out. There's no um, real complications with that nominal, but I want you to know about that. Yeah. All right, so um, we've got four pieces. Very simple. We've gone ahead and you'll have that channel that's already cut out. All right. That channel that's cut out is going to be our back of our shadow box. And it's designed for us to put our masonite piece right into that back channel when we put this all together. So we'll just go ahead and right now we're going to just do a pre test fit. All right. Each of you will be doing the same thing. You know, before we get busy with tape and glue and all that good jazz, we're just going to put this together and make sure that everything fits and looks correct. Just make sure we didn't have any mistakes. Last thing we want to do is actually start gluing before and then find, you know, we don't want to glue and then find mistakes afterwards, right? So all I've done right now is just pop this together into a nice square. Kind of snugging it up a little bit and take a look at how it fits, make sure everything looks good. So, the design of this is for our four walls to be here. All right. um, once we've finished doing our installation of objects, assemblage, sculpture, um, then you'll take your plexiglass, and plexiglass has a film on it. Please don't take that off. Plexiglass scratches really easily. So you want to leave that on and be very careful with this until the last second, right? So that plexiglass is going to sit right inside of that inset on the frame. And then everybody's got these four sticks now, um, or actually I should call them borders. And these are going to be set right on top hold that plexiglass inside and make a really nice frame around that edge. Everybody understand so far? Does anybody have any questions? All right, let's keep moving on. All right, so um, as you might imagine, you know, that frame, these border pieces, um, they're going to go on very, very last, right? Um, our plexiglass is going to go on right before those frame pieces, so that's mostly it. So we're just going to take those parts. We're just going to set them off to the side. And, you know, um, after you see how to glue other things together, you'll quickly understand how you're going to put those top pieces on. I don't have to insult your intelligence with that. Um, all right, so let's learn something real quick, and that's about how to square up anything that is supposed to have 90 degree angles and be symmetrical, right? Um, one of the ways you can do this is if you have a square, like literally one of these things that, you know, is an angled 90, 90 degree angle uh, type of tool, I could grab one, but since you guys don't have one, let's not worry about it. Um, but it's literally just something that's 90 degrees and then you set it against each one of the corners and make sure everything squares up, right? Um, now, if you don't have a square, not a problem. And actually, there is an even better way to find out whether or not what you have is going to be perfectly 90 degrees at every corner. And it's very simple. You're going to take your tape measure, all right, and you're going to set that tape measure on one of the corners. And you have to make sure when you look at that very tip of that tape measure, right, you got to make sure that you're putting like corner right in the middle. There's a tiny little notch right there. Make sure that that notch is directly on the corner. All right. And I'm going to pull it across all the way to the other edge. And I'm going to measure what it is all to the corner. When I measure, I'm measuring right now to the left side of the tape. I could measure to the other side of the tape. The important thing is that you do the same on both corners. So right now I'm measuring from corner to corner. And my first measurement comes out to 22 and almost a half, almost four, about 22 and three eighths, between 22 and three eighths and 22 and a half. And now I'm just going to take this tape measure. I'm going to go to the other corner and I'm going to do the exact same thing. Line it up. 
and I see on this side, it actually says 22 and three quarters. I'm way off. This is not square at all. So I'm gonna push this in on this side. I'm gonna kick it over to about 22 and a half. I'm gonna take it over to the other side, kick it over. Now it's about 22 and three quarters. So I'm just gonna tap it a little bit on this side. And this could take a while, you know? Um, don't rush. You know the old saying, measure, measure twice, cut once. Um, in this case, we're gonna measure several times and just keep tapping until we find It's all nicely squared off. And that looks pretty good. Now this is just my test, all right? I haven't actually applied glue or, or done anything yet, all right? Um, so this is just the test, um, making sure I understand how to square everything off, getting ready to set up. Any questions so far about how to measure that or square this box off? Remember, the most important part is when you pull that tape measure across, right? I'm measuring to this side of the tape measure. I'm measuring to this side, right? When I move it to the other side, I gotta make sure I'm measuring the same side. You can't flip it around or else you're not gonna get the same measurements. All right, so we'll go ahead and take this apart. We know how to do it. So we're just gonna lay everything out like this. All right, we'll take a look at our setup. I'm gonna go source. Good, good. All right, now, the wonderful thing about masking tape, and this is what you're gonna use. You might be a little surprised that masking tape is as useful of a material um, as it is. Um, masking tape is a wonderful way to um, adhere uh, things together. It's Go. Um, the reason masking tape is kind of cool for gluing things together is because it actually has a little, a little bit of stretch to it. Oops, lost the brakes. A little bit of stretch, all right? Just has a little tiny bit of give to it. And what that means is when I tape something, I can kind of wrap it around and it has a little extra pull to it. Now, the reason why that's so important is because you guys are going to be using wood glue. And the one thing that's really important to understand about wood glue is it is amazingly strong, but it only works if it's between two surfaces that are perfectly mashed together, all right? There can't be gaps. There can't be anything. It just has to be perfectly edge to edge, all right? If it's not, the glue won't set. It's just not, it's just not how it works, all right? It is an aerobic glue, which means that it does um, cure when exposed to air, right? But it only cures when it's very thin and squished in between surfaces. So it's an aerobic glue versus an anaerobic glue, which would be like a resin where it doesn't really require air. It requires another type of uh, something to activate the hardener to make it set off. UV glue, right? UV glue requires UV light, maybe from the sun to actually get the glue to work. Um, wood glue is aerobic. It just needs to be exposed to air. Um, okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and pull a whole bunch of little pieces of masking tape off and set them up. Not, you know, just little two, three inch pieces, no big deal. I'm gonna want yeah, two, maybe, maybe three, you know, you guys can choose. Um, two or three um, per edge of the board. So I'm gonna put two here, I'm gonna put two here, I'm gonna put two here, I'm gonna put two over there. So that comes out to a total of eight. Two, three, four, five, six, 
couple of more in case something screws up. So, here's what I'm going to do. There's a lot of different ways to do this. I mean, you know, this is my way. Or, you know, you can kind of figure out some other methods. I'm just going to put a piece of tape on here. A piece of tape on here, like so. All right, so I got two pieces on that corner. Now I'm going to have two pieces on this corner. So essentially, what I'm doing is I'm kind of putting hinges on the edge of each one of these boards. Voila. All right. So now I'm going to take one board and this board. And what I'm going to do here, set it up like this, make sure the channels are matching up. That would be bad if the channels didn't match up. And then I'm just going to take the tape. All right. And now I basically have a hinge, All right? Just like that. Now I've got a 90 degree angle. Simple as that. Okay, so let's move down to the next piece. Again, making sure that the channel matches up with the channel. Last but not least, here's my final piece. All right. Got four pieces, all hinged. All right, any questions? Next up then. So, um, wood glue. Right, it, it is a uh, resin based and they're not kidding when they say it makes like they make it out of things like horse hooves. Um, they really use um, amazingly strong stuff. Like they actually perfected this back, uh, this kind of formula back in this, you know, probably seventies or whatnot. Um, wood glue is amazingly strong. If you use it correctly, most of the time it's stronger than the wood itself. So if I glue two pieces of wood, like if I took the two pieces of these wood and I just slapped them together, clamped them and put the wood glue on, when I try to break them apart, the wood will break before the glue does, like literally rips off before the glue rips off, right? Um, amazingly strong stuff. Um, so it's wonderful, as long as you use it correctly. Glue, like any product that you, know, you ever use, I always have the same exact instructions and advice. Same time, same thing. Every time when you buy something, don't ask your professor, your teacher, or anybody else how long to glue it for or how it works. Turn the bottle over and read the instructions. That simple. Don't, you know, I, I can't help you. Like, you're not going to pay an instructor to read the instructions for you. All right. It's the same thing anytime you buy paint, stain, glue, resin, plaster, mold making materials, clay, ceramics, glaze, right? Anything, the company has written instructions on how to use it. Use the product the way the company tells you to use it, and you can't go wrong, all right? Make up your own rules or just do whatever somebody tells you to do. And then you'll never know if you really, really have the product working the correct way. So each of us have the same exact bottles. Surfaces must be clean and dry. Got that done, joints should fit 
tightly, we talked about that. Apply a heavy spread of glue to surface and clamp for a minimum of 30 minutes. Do not stress joints for 24 hours. Remove excess wet glue with clean, damp cloth. Close cap after use. So that's why I have my tiny little bucket of a little tiny bit of water. I'm gonna grab a few paper towels. That's what I'm gonna be using in your own home, whatever, all right? Just know that whatever you wipe up with the glue, you're gonna have to throw that away. So if you're using like a, a cloth rag or something, you're gonna have to toss it because the glue will stick in it and dry. It's gonna get screwed up, okay? So you know, paper towels or you know napkins, paper towels are, are better. Um, and when it says, you're gonna say, it says there, right there, it says damp cloth. You don't want a lot of water, all right? You don't want a lot of water on your wood, it messes it up. Um, a lot of times you don't water on the table you're working on. So like this masonite table that I'm working on, I don't wanna get a bunch of water on it. I'll soak right through, mess this up. So um, we're not looking to create a water fountain when we go to clean up, all right, just damp. Um, user tips, uh, not for continuous immersion or use below the water line, not for structural or load bearing applications. Use when temperature, glue and materials are above 55 degrees. That's kind of important. Um, a lot of people try to glue stuff together outside in the wintertime um, below the operating temperature of the product and then it never sets up correctly. I don't expect any of you guys to have to work below 55 degrees, but if you do, like if you go out in your backyard to do this, um, you know, make sure it's a day where there's just enough, you know, enough sunlight to keep it warm enough to, to set up or whatnot. Uh, sand glued area thoroughly before staining, if you guys are gonna stain, uh, and store at room temperature. All right, simple enough instructions, but you wanna read them. And different glues, they might say, hey, you need to uh, let that set for an hour. Um, hey, you only have to have 12 hours before it can take a structural load or something or stress. So we've read this, we understand what we've got going on. Uh, it says a healthy dose of glue on the joints and that's absolutely true. Um, but you also don't wanna go overboard. Um, the, uh, you know, what's going to happen is that we're going to put enough glue into these joints. And what we want to see is that when we press them together, that there's a tiny bit of seepage of glue that comes out around the corners. That means that the glue is all the way across the joint and there's plenty of it in there, but, you know, we don't want to overdo it because then we're just going to get glue all over the place and be wiping stuff down. So, you know, your first time doing this, you know, it, it, you, you, it's going to be a little bit of an estimation. But you'll figure it out pretty quick. I mean, you've all used Elmer glue bottles in the past, and this is basically the same thing. So um, what we're going to have to remember is I'm going to put one joint together, all right? And then when I go to the next joint, I'm going to have to go ahead and put my masonite board in, all right? Um, I'm gonna put just a, a little dab of glue down the channels so that as I wrap this up when the masonite board tucks in, um, that'll cinch up a little bit as well. And that's gonna give us a lot of structure, um, a lot of uh, a strength to the overall structure of it. Um, it's not really you know, you know, that kind of necessary um, unless you guys are gonna be doing some wild stuff to these things, which you might, I don't know. Maybe one of you guys is gonna like make a shadow box and drop it off the top of a building as your, you know, some of your comment on self-identity. Uh, so maybe, maybe you do need to really think about making it as strong as possible. All right, so um, when I get to that second part, I'll throw that board in um, and I'm gonna turn this over on its side so I can wrap it up a little bit easier. Okay. Let me move this stuff out of the way, a little mise en place before I actually get to this gluing. I don't need any of this stuff you now. Locking and jamming me up while I'm doing this. So I'm gonna put that all the way down there. And just for giggles, this was optional. I, I mentioned this, guys, in your syllabus. You might want an apron when you guys are doing stuff like this. This is the apron that I use in the shop all the time. And, you know, it's just, you know, my, my body's leaning up against the table. 
Um, there's glue, uh, you know, there's sawdust, there's little wood splinters. And, you know, anytime you're in a shop, right, um, you're going to have these, these things that pop out. And it just saves my clothes, essentially. You know, I, I used to buy, you know, a gajillion T-shirts every month because I didn't wear an apron. And I'd constantly be kind of making these tiny tears in my shirts and whatnot. So um, if you do work in a shop a lot, um, and, you know, this, this applies to, of course, painting studios or, or, or printmaking, whatever, uh, ceramics. Like, you don't want to ruin your clothes. So an apron is all, often pretty nice. Nothing worse than getting some glue in your shirt and uh, having to go buy a new one at Target. Um, all right. So let me think a little bit. Well, how am I going to do this? Wrap it up here. I think I'm going to go ahead and set this up on its side by grabbing a bunch of them all at the same time. Let me just do that. Double check I didn't lose any of my taped corners. Anybody have any questions yet? You all good? Holler out if you do. Double checking my table again, cleaning off. There were some little pieces of junk here. And as you can imagine, any tiny little piece of stuff underneath of a board, you lift it up one way or the other, and you're going to come out with something that's um, crooked. All right. So I'm just going to open these up enough so I can get to the wood or the corners. And start, I think, over here. Um, the surface area you're, you're attaching is pretty small, right? So if that was like a much bigger surface area, I would say that you got to make sure that the glue is kind of like zigzagged across the whole area. But for you guys, there's so such a small area. Just, you know, you can make a straight line and you'll be just fine. So I'm going to clean a little bit as I go. And... Um, I'm going to clean as I go because that glue is going to drip down onto the table, which not only makes a mess, but later on when you're done gluing everything, you'll have your piece stuck to the table. It's not cool. So I've gone ahead and just cleaned it up. Squeeze it in a little bit and then move on to the next one. Go ahead and put a tiny bit of glue in the channel on these two pieces. Take my board, let's go ahead and mount that in. Wrap that one over. you got some working time here. Like when you put this glue together, it's not going to give you trouble to maneuver it around for about three to five minutes. All right. That's a good amount of working time, but you don't want to, you don't want to spend all day. All right. So if, you're in the middle of this and all of a sudden you go like, oh my gosh, something's gone terribly wrong. Um, the best idea is just to yank everything apart and wipe all the glue off just as fast as you can using damp cloth. All right. You don't want to get everything like half glued together and be panicking. If, if you start to put this together and something's really wrong, the best thing to do is just abort it, all right? Just stop what you're doing, take everything apart, and clean it kind of as fast as you can. All right, so, right? We got this all together. I'm going to get in here and clean up any of this glue. I was pretty good about being careful about the amount of glue I used on the other parts, so let me maybe 
when you lift that up a little bit, you, you know, you can kind of see maybe a little bit of, can you see it? Tiny bit of glue, like in the corners here. I'm just gonna clean that out. Um, if you can see this on the table, all right, there's glue that came off on the table. I'm gonna go ahead and lift up the box. Get another piece of damp cloth. Make sure I clean the back side. Go ahead and clean off my table. Again, damp cloth, right? Not wet. We don't want to ruin our wood and make a whole mess. All right, now I'm going to drop it back down. Push up a few of these spots. Now, if you have a little bit of glue that squeezes out in the end and you don't quite catch it, it's not the end of the world. A little sandpaper usually cleans that right up. All right. What I'm going to do now, the wood's never perfect. It's never perfect. All right. There's always going to be a little bit of something, something that's going to happen where you're going to have to compromise. Um, now, what you're going to do is look at the very top edge of the the box and make sure those corners are lined up as best they can be, all right? Because that's the visual part people are going to see. If that bottom little corner doesn't square off perfectly, you know, that's easier to kind of sand it down and the viewer won't really notice it that much. Um, I've got a corner over here that's not cinching up really tight, right? Just that top section. So I'm just going to pull off another piece of tape. I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it on one side. I'm going to give it a good pull. A good pull. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I'm kind of putting some tension on it. And when I did that, that corner came right together. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and check the other corners and see if anything needs that same attention. Um, even if it doesn't need that attention, it's not a bad idea. Right. Just go like so. Really pull that together. And, you know, I, I kind of want you guys to be impressed by the fact that some glue and some tape right, can pull all this together. Um, you know, we could get into having to use hardware where it's like drills and screws and everything else. And that's great. That has its place and its purpose. But it's kind of neat that all you have to do is just get some pieces of wood cut the right size and you're going to be good to go to make things. All right. So I'm feeling good about this. Now I'm going to make my measurements. All right. I've got 22 and 5 eighths. I've got 22 and... Well, you know, quite frankly, I already have 22 and 5 eighths, so I wouldn't really have to mess with this. Um, it came out perfectly, but if I did have to mess with it, I would just like this tap from the corners, and you'll see it kind of move, but it's just a tiny little tapping. All right. Um, I actually, when I tapped it, I could feel it move a little bit, so now I got to fix it. All right, now, what did it say? 30 minutes minimum, no touching, right? 30 minutes minimum. It's done, it's put together, it's now gluing. If you touch it in the next 30 minutes, you will compromise your uh, glue joint. It will no longer have the structural integrity it would have if you had just left it alone for 30 minutes. 
in 30 minutes. If you would need to, you can pick it up and put it somewhere else. All right. But don't jostle it. Don't shake it around. Don't do anything to it for 24 hours. After 24 hours, you can drop it off of the side of a building. All right. But for that first period of time, follow the instructions They're written right here. If you don't remember what I said. Okay. Um, at the end of what you're doing, you know, your, your glue bottle will often have a little glue on it. It's a really, really important that you go ahead and clean all that off. All right. All that glue gums up the tip and then you'll use your glue bottle one time and then be one of those people with a knife trying to like pull out all the dried glue that's all over it. So you can use it again, just like an Elmer's glue bottle, right? No different, except this is stronger. Uh, so make sure you clean off your, your bottle really well. Look around your workspace. Um, you know, if you guys were actually here in the shop um, working, I'd also say, hey, we got to get a broom out and sweep up, even though we didn't even make any sawdust, we make dirt and move stuff around no matter what. Um, so clean up your work area really well. Okay. Um, and then just wait. All right. And... The next step is now how will you want to invest into that space? Now, I guess in a way you can think of this as your Petri dish where you get to run an experiment in your own time. Um, does anybody have any questions? I hope you have questions. It always makes me nervous if nobody has questions. No? We're all good? Okay. Um, let me see if I can stop. I have a quick question. Sure, hit me. I like questions. Go for it. <laughs> it's probably something you already said, but I just want to make sure. Um, is it the smooth? The, it's the smooth part, right, from the cardboard. That, What's that? it's like up where. Oh, um, right. the cardboard that we put. Right. Sorry. That's uh, not cardboard. It's called masonite. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mason, as in as you got M A S O N I T E. All right. And yes, it has a smooth side and then it has that that other textured side. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, I put the smooth side. Uh, I mean, I think the okay. other side looks awful. Um, I guess if you wanted to use that textured side as you're interfacing, you could do that. Sure. Um, but I mean, uh, aesthetically, I designed it so that smooth side would be facing out. Um, good question. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else?